Hi, everyone. My name is Madeline. I use she, her pronouns, and I work at Cohere for AI. I'm here today hosting on my colleague Joao's behalf. Joao set up this event and sends his regrets, but that means it is my pleasure to welcome Jonas Pfeiffer, our speaker today. Jonas is a research scientist at Google Research working on natural language processing with a focus on modular representation learning in multitask, multilingual, and multi multimodal context and in low resource scenarios. He's also one of the main contributors of the adapterhub.ml framework, which makes it very easy to add and train new parameters within pre-trained transformer-based language models. If you have questions during Jonas's presentation, I invite you to add them to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible following Jonas's presentation. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. And thank you so much, Jonas. With that, I'll hand things over to you to get started. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to be able to talk about some of my research and uh, my colleagues' research and the general direction of modular uh, and parameter efficient transfer learning in NLP. Um, yeah, so the topic uh, of my talk is uh, on modular and compositional transfer learning. And first of all, I will look into modularity and compositionality, what I understand uh, under these terms. Um, I'm going to provide you with a brief introduction to what adapters are uh, and how adapters are actually modular and comp co uh, composable. I'll then look into uh, a cross-lingual transfer scenario, um, which is an application of uh, yeah, the out of distribution generalization capabilities of these modular adapters. And finally look into how we can actually mitigate catastrophic interference uh, during pre-training with these modular components. Uh, the first part of this talk will go, uh, yeah, I'll only provide you with a higher level to long didn't read basically uh, understanding of, of the topics, whereas I'll uh, provide some more um, details on the final part of this talk. Okay, so what do I understand under modularity and compositionality? So let's assume that we have a skill and a task in one component, one block, and another skill or task or component in, in another block and we try to compose these two uh, modules so that we perform well um, on a third task that is potentially completely unseen. So why is this important? Um, as we all uh, know, the current models are increasing in size with 175 billion parameters, but also trillion parameters and even larger models coming out more or less monthly. Um, we require parameter efficient fine tuning strategies to actually um, yeah, utilize these capabilities in a more yeah, um, uh, realistic scenario um, that we can use these models in many different um, yeah, settings. So uh, the second uh, reason is uh, we have a lot of unseen scenarios. So for example, imagine that again, we have a skill but we are interested in multiple different languages. For example, uh, we have a lot of training data available in English, but we are often uh, interested in under-resourced languages um, where we often don't have these uh, tra this training data available. So if we're able to decompose skills or tasks from, for example, languages, we can compose these uh, building blocks so that we perform well in unseen uh, scenarios such as cross-lingual transfer. And thirdly, we experience a lot of catastrophic interference. So imagine that we have one model um, with the parameters uh, theta defined here, and we try and try to fine tune these uh, these parameters on images, videos, speech, text, text in many different languages, all at the same time then this is basically a standard multitask learning setup. And uh, here we experience a lot of catastrophic interference between all these diff different tasks where the um, 
parameter count, um, yeah, just is not enough for all these, uh, for the model to kind of learn all of these tasks simultaneously. So by integrating modularity, we might be able to mitigate this problem. And fourth, uh, we uh, basically, every time we uh, finish training a model on massive amounts of unlabeled text, it is outdated. So for example, if we ask the model who the president of the US is, then um, this information changes over time. And it's very inefficient to pre-train um, these models every single time. So maybe by integrating uh, modular updates, um, it is more efficient to update the model such that it integrates the new information um, uh, more efficiently. So what are adapters? Um, let's first of all look at standard uh, full model fine tuning where we start, for example, with a transformer models such as BERT, Roberta, or whatever you want. Uh, what we usually do is we fine tune all the weights um, uh, of this pre-trained model on our downstream task. So optimizing um, the model based on the data loss and so on. Um, yeah, for adapters, it is a bit different. We actually pull apart every single layer of a pre-trained model and add new uh, weights to this uh, pre-trained model. These weights are randomly initialized. And instead of fine tuning all the weights, we encapsulate these uh, newly introduced weights, uh, adapter weights um, phi between uh, theta uh, of the pre-trained models and uh, freeze them. So basically only updating the newly introduced weights theta on our uh, training data set. Uh, the surrounding parameters are frozen. And this was first introduced by um, Olsby et al for the NLP scenarios. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, introducing the so-called bottleneck adapters. So um, this is the most frequent used uh, uh, adapter in recent times. It basically just consists of a down projection, an up projection, uh, nonlinear activation function, and an up projection together with some residual connections. And they can be placed uh, after the feed forward component uh, and uh, or after the multi head attention component. Um, they, the, the first question that we might have is well, okay, you can add these layers, uh, but does it actually perform? Uh, similarly, so if we look at the performance on glue tasks, I think these are um, BERT uh, weights that we uh, that we initialize the model with. Um, in red, you can see the full model fine tuning, so the standard way of fine tuning the model on the respective downstream task, whereas the blue bars are the two respective um, adapter architectures. Uh, that you can see on the left. Now we can see that the performance is more or less the same. Sometimes um, adapters are better. Sometimes, um, yeah, the, uh, the full model fine tuning is slightly better, but on average, the performance is uh, quite similar between um, full model fine tuning compared to uh, adapter training. Um, however, the total number of trainable parameters is significantly lower for adapters. So here, we can see the number of trainable parameters for model, full model fine tuning versus adapters. Um, and in putting this into other context, um, if we have two tasks that we're interested in, then uh, we require roughly one gigabyte of, uh, of parameters uh, to be stored if we fully fine tune the model for the same amount of um, space we can train more than 200 adapters on these different tasks. That is because uh, all these different adapters uh, demonstrated by these uh, colorful small lines um, can share the pre-trained weights of the, um, of, the, of the model because these are frozen and uh, we just need to store these additional adapters uh, for each individual task. Okay, so uh, we've looked at the bottleneck adapter, but uh, this was just the first architecture that uh, was presented um, back in 2017. 
Since then, a lot of different architectures have been proposed, such as prefix tuning, where the multi-head attention um, uh, is extended. We have compactors, which actually decompose um, the bottleneck adapters uh, to be even more parameter efficient. There is LoRa, which um, uh, yeah uh, extends the um, uh, the the uh, multi-head attention layer as well. Uh, then we have parallel adapters, which instead of sequential processing of the representations, processes them in parallel. We have Unipelt, uh, which is actually a gating mechanism that um, allows us to integrate multiple different. Uh, adapter architectures and the model has the power to uh, automatically select which adapter it wants to use. We also recently have IA cubed or IA3. I'm not sure how uh, they want us to um, pronounce it, which also builds on the um, multi add attention uh, component by uh, providing an element wise addition um, of the representations on the key and value pairs as well as the up projection and the feed forward layer uh, of the standard transformer. Now, as you can see, all of these uh, architectures are quite different. Um, in common, they all have in common that they're freezing uh, the pre-trained weights and adding new parameters. Um, and uh, depending on what task these models are, these uh, parameter efficient architectures are trained on, they achieve different performances. Some are some have the focus of being very parameter efficient. Uh, some um, uh, have the uh, yeah the focus more on the downstream task performance. But in general, their concepts is, are very similar. Um, in my talk, I'll however predominantly focus on the bottleneck adapter um, because it uh, allows us. Uh, more flexibility in uh, terms of uh, parameter count um, and uh, in general performs uh, the best because uh, yeah the the parameter count uh, the number yeah the number of trainable parameters uh, can be defined quite dynamically um, and uh, basically each module can be given uh, a lot more capacity compared to some of the other methods but I would assume uh, that a lot of these ideas that I will be talking about can be extended to these alternative adapter architectures as well. Um, it just hasn't been done yet. Okay, so uh, the first question is whether or not adapters are actually modular. We've looked at them from a parameter efficiency aspect, um, but the question that I have asked myself is whether or not we can train uh, these uh, adapters on multiple different tasks and then compose them to perform better in, on a, in other scenarios. So to answer that question, um, we need to look at whether or not they are somewhat exchangeable um, or composable. So basically, if we have two adapters uh, trained on different tasks, such as a blue task and a green task, um, are they somewhat interchangeable, um, even though they have been trained independent of each other? So um, how can we test that? Um, let us assume that we have uh, four different uh, adapters. And now we have yellow, purple, green, and blue tasks. Uh, so these adapters have already been trained on the respective task, but now we are trying to uh, compose them uh, to perform better. Um, and one scenario, let us, let us assume that we have a composition function that is kind of uh, in, yeah, unimportant right now. It's a black box composition function that utilizes these different adapters to perform better on the same number, same task. So one scenario uh, that could happen is that basically um, only select uh, its own adapter. So the composition function identifies that uh, task one performs best if only the representations of the yellow task or uh, yellow adapter are used, whereas purple uses the purple adapter and so on. So this would indicate, well, that maybe these adapters are not composable. The second scenario that could happen when we uh, test this is that only a single best adapter is uh, used. So for example, um, all the tasks identify the purple adapter to perform best for their respective task. 
one example would be, for example, MNLI is a, in general, very good pre-training task uh, where when we pre-train on or interme intermediately fine-tune on MNLI and then fine-tune the model again on our target task, the performance is often better. And this is something that uh, would also indicate that maybe these adapters are not composable if only one single task adapter is always used. The third scenario, which we're hoping for, is that the model is actually able to compose multiple different uh, adapters uh, to perform better on the target task. So in this scenario, um, to solve task one, um, the compositionality function composes um, the purple and the blue adapter. Okay, so let's look into how we can construct such a compositionality function. Um, in our paper, uh, Adapter Fusion, uh, we propose an, um, uh, an attention mechanism where we start with uh, three pre-trained adapters uh, trained on different tasks, and we learn an attention mechanism where the input to the adapter is interpreted as the query, whereas the output of each of the individual adapters is in interpreted as the key and value. So the dot product of query and key followed by a softmax function um, results in the dynamic weighting of the respective uh, adapters uh, so that the model can yeah, dynamically weight which adapter at the respective layers is most important to solve the downstream task. Um, so uh, our scenario is that we start with a pool of 16 different adapters trained on many different tasks. We then learn this adapter fusion mechanism on top of all of those adapters. So the adapter fusion can select all these adapters. Uh, and then we fine tune on the respective same tasks again. And this is a bit of an academic scenario because uh, we are uh, fine tuning on the same tasks again. Um, in more realistic scenarios, we would obviously want to have a large pool of adapters available and perform better in an unseen uh, or low resource uh, data set. However, in order to identify whether or not adapters are modular, we want to probe for the first scenario, basically, if the adapter uh, or if the compositionality function would actually just select its own adapter again. Um, yeah. So uh, we can first of all look at the attention uh, mecha uh, parts at every single layer. So uh, these uh, heat maps are the uh, activations of adapter fusion at the different layers in the model. I only have uh, three uh, layers here, but in our paper, you can look at all the layers um, where the y-axis is the uh, target task that we're trying to solve. And the x-axis is the uh, adapter that was activated at the respective layer. So the diagonal means that the task has selected basically its own adapter. And we can see that for high resource languages, such as in multi NLI, um, the same adapter is always used. However, for low resource tasks, for example, um, uh, CB uh, at layer seven combines the representations of multi NLI and QQP. So high resource tasks tend to um, utilize only their own adapter, whereas low resource tasks tend to not activate their own adapter at all but actually combine representations of multiple different adapters um, and different adapters at different layers. So for example, CB uses uh, argument, the argument adapter in layer nine, combines multi and line QQP in layer seven and uh, only utilizes uh, uh, multi and line in layer one. So this does indicate that uh, it is able to compose and combine the representations of multiple adapters uh, with this mechanism. When looking at the performance, um, here we have the relative performance gains of fusion over just the adapter itself. So basically just fine tuning the adapter on the task itself uh, and whether or not uh, a fusion comp combination actually results in an improvement. 
um, we list the, uh, the tasks from high resource to low resource set tasks. And we can see that, uh, especially for low resource languages, we can see the performance gains. Whereas for uh, high resource tasks, the performance is more or less the same. And this uh, explains the uh, activation patterns that we've experienced here. Basically, what these results indicate is that um, there is no useful information from the other adapters available for the high resource tasks. Um, basically, it's enough to just fine tune on um, their own task, uh, on, the infer on, the, uh, on the examples of their own task, uh, and no, there's no useful information from other uh, tasks, uh, at least uh, not within this pool of adapters that we have available. However, low resource languages, uh, low resource tasks um, are able to improve by combining the representations of other adapters, uh, resulting in a uh, performance gain. So this does indicate that um, these uh, adapters, although they are trained independent of each other, are composable. Um, and that is by uh, simply by the fact that the surrounding parameters are uh, frozen, encapsulating the uh, 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 newly introduced uh, adapter weights and uh, yeah, encapsulating them uh, and therefore uh, forcing them to be somewhat interchangeable and composable. Okay, now with that information, uh, we will go over and uh, try to utilize that in, uh, in cross-lingual transfer scenarios uh, uh, yeah, in, uh, to, for out of distribution generalization capabilities. But uh, maybe uh, I can stop here and uh, see if there are any questions. Have adapters been uh, used outside of the NLP context? Yes, they have. Uh, so actually, um, they uh, were proposed uh, for the uh, vision domain. Um, the first paper was, I think it was a CVPR paper by Rebuffy, Rebuffy et al. Uh, and it's integrated into convolutional neural networks and uh, Holsby and uh, et al. and uh, Bapna et al. extended it to the NLP domain. Um, so adapters seem to take much longer to train uh, hundreds of epochs uh, uh, as compared to full fine tuning uh, five epochs. So how exactly are we getting benefit? Both are using same compute during forward pass, only backward is a bit different, right? So I don't think it's, uh, it really depends on um, what task you're training on. Um, if it's a high resource task, then the difference between low resource, uh, between adapters and uh, full model fine tuning isn't that big. So for example, multi NLI, you can train adapters and a full model fine tuning for more or less the same number of epochs um, without a performance difference. Uh, for low resource tasks, there is a difference. I think the reason is that you know the adapters are randomly initialized, so they need, do need to be trained a lot more than uh, if you already have uh, pre-trained weights. Um, but the argument is that if you have a low resource data set, then training is um, is even more, uh, it, it won't take a lot of time anyways. Uh, so there's a trade-off there. Uh, the benefit is um, especially um, at the parameter count. So basically, if you want to store many different adapter, uh, many different tasks simultaneously, because uh, you're interested in hundreds of tasks, for example, then uh, with a full, uh, fully fine-tuned model, you'd have to have complete copies of the entire model um, on your server. Uh, whereas with adapters, you just need to um, store the difference, like the smaller uh, smaller bottleneck layers, or if you do prompt engineering, uh, prompt tuning, then it's just a prompt that you have to store, whereas the surrounding parameters are all shared between all different tasks. So there's a huge uh, gain that you can get from that. Um, basically, yeah, covering many more um, many more uh, tasks simultaneously. Um, cool. Uh, a fair comparison 
this is always jumping. A fair comparison between single adapters versus extrusion shouldn't consider an equivalent number of parameters, larger single adapters versus smaller fusion adapters. Um, a fair comparison between single adapters. Uh, 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 yes. Um, so um, the the way that we uh, in, implement the fusion architecture is actually that uh, it um, has very little amount of capacity or trainable parameters. The only thing that we more or less learn is uh, the query and key. Uh, the adapters are actually all frozen. Uh, the pre trained on different adapter uh, on different tasks, those are frozen. So um, it is a very small transformation that we allow uh, for each of the individual adapters. And the majority of training should be um, the weighting of the respective adapters. So um, it, it's a bit of a difficult um, calculation to just say we're, we'll train much larger adapters uh, and I uh, and actually um, increasing the capacity of the adapters often results in worse performance. So yes, there is a, a bit of a, uh, a discrepancy there. Uh, I can tell you that it's not going to perform better and it's actually an unfair comparison to compare that, but I think that um, that would require a bit of longer explanation that we don't have time for. We can discuss that later. But we did try to consider that, um, yeah. What is the reduction in the wall clock time to fine tuning? Um, so we do see a uh, strong uh, improvement um, during training uh, because we don't have to calculate the gradients for all of the components. Um, I th th we have a paper called adapter drop. Um, I don't know if I can answer that, uh, type that anywhere. So if you look for adapter drop, we have a um, very uh, thorough evaluation of training time of full model fine tuning versus uh, adapter training. And I remember that there was a uh, improvement of 40% um, just because of the, I think, computation of the gradient. Uh, it also depends on what PyTorch version you have. I believe older versions don't have this optimization in there. Um, may, I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, my numbers are correct with newer versions of PyTorch, but yeah, there, is a, there was a significant improvement in time. Um, did you analyze the characteristics of the attention adapter for specific layers? For example, uh, zero near input versus later near output. Are there any in interesting things there? Um, so the uh, attention mechanism is, um, is different. Uh, it turns out that the last layer uh, has a lot of noise in it. Um, there are some, we did have some additional experiments uh, later after adapter fusion was actually already published that if we don't have adapters in the very final layer, the performance actually improves because the fat last adapter is actually placed right after the um, prediction head. So the last adapter is actually just an extension of the prediction head, which introduced some, some noise because it's no longer encapsulated between frozen uh, layers. So there is a difference there. We did not investigate uh, any 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 attention mechanism beyond that. Um, it. I'm hoping. I was always hoping for somebody else to do that. Um, I haven't had time. Uh, I think it's very interesting. In adapter drop, however, we do identify that um, depending on the task type, for example, very linguistic tasks. If you drop adapters in the very lower layers. Uh, like COLA, for example, the performance absolutely tanks. So you need to fine tune adapters at lower layers as well. Um, but uh, yeah, other tasks, for example, 
multi-MLI, you can just add adapters in the last six layers. Um, yeah, so so there is a difference there. We didn't analyze it from an attention mechanism yet. Um, does the architecture of an adapter have to be in a linear network? Can we use convolutions, for instance? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think that depending on um, the domain that you're looking at, um, it makes sense to uh, to look at convolutions. So I think, for example, in speech, um, a lot of like conformer has some convolutional layers in in the transformer as well. Uh, obviously, in the uh, in in the vision domain, um, convolutions make a lot of sense. Um, I, I don't think. Uh, I don't have a preference to what type of architecture is used. It's not the fo focus of my work, at least. So uh, I was always inter 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 more interested in the modularity aspects of these architectures, uh, where I just used um, the best performing architecture. But there's a lot of people interest, very interested in the parameter efficiency aspect. Um, and their uh, different architectures are proposed, as I had uh, in my earlier slides. So I don't think um, there's any reason against convolutions. What do you? What is your thought on BitFit? It seems to be quite different from adapters, prompt tuning, or LoRa. Actually, BitFit is very similar to LoRa, as far as I know, um, because both are kind of sparse. Uh, I think the LoRa way of training it is a bit different, but it's both very sparse training. Uh, prompt tuning, on the other hand, is uh, yeah, uh, is is very simple to train uh, because you just add these adapters at the input. Um, in general, I think that sp uh, sparse fine tuning is super interesting. There's actually some papers uh, that came out um, at uh, where was it at I believe NACL, um, it's called LTSFT. Uh, so it utilizes the um, lottery ticket hypothesis to identify subnetworks um, uh, that are useful for language modeling pre-training. Um, and the compositionality function can be just arithmetic operations. So for example, you can add a language um, subnetwork to a task subnetwork and subtract it and so on and do cross-lingual transfer. So this is very related to the next part that I will be talking about. Um, but it's uh, these these sparse modular networks are are super interesting and very related to adapters. It's just a kind of different way of modularizing the model. Um, would you consider soft prompts and adapters as the same or different? Um, I would say it's somewhat the same thing um, because, yeah, I think a soft prompt is uh, just a, a special case of prefix tuning um, where prefix tuning adds soft prompts at every layer, uh, whereas soft prompts are just at the input. Um, so yeah, like it's very parameter efficient, performs significantly worse than uh, adapters, but it's uh, it's a way of integrating the information of one specific task language or, or so on in this very specific parts of the model. Um, so you can definitely um, yeah do some uh, compositionality stuff with with soft prompt as well. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, I'll try to get back to my talk now. Let's see how much time we have. All right. Uh, so now that we've kind of established that uh, adapters are modular to a certain degree, uh, we want to look at their out of distribution generalization capabilities. Um, and this task that we're going to look at specifically is zero shot uh, transfer to low resource languages where what we usually start with is by pre-training a multilingual model on massive amounts of text using MLM. We then fine tune the model on a task in a high resource source language. So for example, English, and then evaluate the model in our low resource target language. So why is this important? 
well, training data is expensive and often not available for the languages that we're interested in, especially those languages that are considered low resource. So as all of you know, um, there's a lot of multilingual models out there, such as MBERT and XLMR, and they achieve a great, great cross-lingual transfer performance, but they suffer from the so-called curse of multilinguality, where um, the more languages uh, we pre-train on, uh, the worse the performance uh, per language actually gets, which is especially a problem for low resource languages and those that um, are not covered during pre-training. Uh, so this hinders us from actually representing all the 7,000 languages in a single model. Um, in our approach that we proposed uh, at EMNLP in 2020, we actually still assume that due to this massive multilinguality of Embert and XLMR, um, it's still the perfect grounds for transfer learning to unseen languages. Um, and in our uh, approach, we uh, incorporate adapters for languages that are seen, such as English and Chinese, but also languages that are unseen, such, such as Quechuan and Guarani. And we also uh, add uh, task uh, adapters, uh, for example, for name entity recognition, COPA, and so on. And we hope to learn somewhat language agnostic task adapters that are stacked on top of these language adapters. Uh, I'll go into that a bit later. Um, but by disentangling the task from the language component, we hope to perform better in zero shot transfer uh, scenarios. So, um, MADEX consists of multiple steps. In step one, we train language adapters. So uh, for example, on monolingual corpora uh, using math language modeling. So we fine tune these blue adapters on English. And in parallel, we also train uh, language adapters on the target language. So for example, Quechuan. In step two, we then train a task adapter and this is stacked on top of the output of the language adapter. Uh, so that uh, during training, uh, uh, we freeze not only the training, uh, the pre-trained weights, but also the pre-trained language adapter, only fine tuning the task adapter on the target uh, task. So that in step three, we can replace the source language adapter, English with the target language adapter, Quechua, uh, to perform zero shot inference. Uh, where we reuse the task adapter that was trained only on English data. We evaluate this on a number of uh, source languages coming from different language families using different scripts, uh, English, Chinese, Japanese, and Arabic. And we transfer it to uh, three seen languages, but underrepresented. So Georgian, for example, um, is a language that Embert was pre-trained on, but it's somewhat underrepresented. We have a set of unseen languages uh, with seen scripts. So for example, Wolof is a uh, uh, African language that, um, that uh, Embert was not trained on. However, it is written in Latin script. Latin obviously uh, is, uh, is a script that Embert was trained on, but Wolof, the language itself, is not a language that Embert had seen. And finally, we have a set of unseen scripts. So for example, Tibetan um, is written in a very specific Tibetan script that Embert has not seen at all uh, during pre-training. Uh, we evaluate on a number of, diff of different tasks. I will only go into details of NER in my talk though. Uh, so let's first of all, look at the standard fine tuning procedure here, Embert we can see that there's a huge degradation in performance when we go from seen to unseen scripts. Um, whereas MADX uh, considerably outperforms Embert, especially for languages that uh, the model has not been pre-trained on. Um, uh, yeah, uh, increasing the performance quite dramatically. However, the performance drop um, for unseen scripts is uh, still there. Um, we do see slight improvements, but um, yeah, the performance is still terrible for unseen scripts. Uh, so we can say that both Embert and Amadex fail for unseen scripts. And why is that the case? Uh, so when scripts have never been seen before, uh, in this specific case, uh, we are looking at the Amaric script. If Embert is uh, tokenized, 
uh, if the script is tokenized by an Ember tokenizer, even though it has seen hundreds of languages, uh, this, this specific script has not been uh, seen before. So the fallback option is still an unknown token and the model basically has no way of representing that language at all. So in our follow-up paper, we try to uh, extend the Ember um, uh, model to unseen scripts, uh, where the simplest solution is to actually replace the tokenizer. Um, uh, and uh, the problem here, however, is that we lose a lot of information of the original embedding matrix. Um, we try out many different things, um, matrix, uh, decomposition, uh, clustering, and so on. Uh, it turns out that the simplest solution is actually copying the lexically overlapping uh, embeddings from the old tokenizer to the new tokenizer. So for example, numbers exist in both vocabularies often, but also borrowed entities um, from different languages um, are often used. And so we kind of anchor the new embedding space into those uh, pre-trained uh, embeddings, significantly improving the performance. And uh, once we have this initialized embedding matrix, we fine tune the embeddings together with the adapters on our target, uh, target language, again, using mask language modeling, similarly to what we did in MADX uh, to fine tune these uh, adapters. Now let's get back to the performance. As uh, I mentioned, the unseen scripts are terrible, but if we extend this Maddox approach with, um, with the vocabulary extension, we significantly improve the performance uh, as we can see here on unseen scripts. We also see very small gains for seen and unseen languages, which is uh, maybe due to the case that um, these scripts are somewhat underrepresented in the Ember, to Ember tokenizer we give it a more a bit uh, larger vocabulary. So this might be the reason why we small see some small gains for these seen and unseen languages. However, the largest gains are for unseen scripts um, where our, our approach basically allows us to extend um, a, a pre-trained multilingual model to not only unseen languages, but also unseen scripts. All right. We have a similar extension, which I don't have time to go into a lot uh, for multilingual multimodal transfer. We have a data set for cross-lingual uh, uh, visual question answering, similar results to what I've just discussed with adapters and so on. So please check that out if you're interested in that. Um, it includes a new data set as well. Um, so the final part is uh, looking at mitigating catastrophic interference during pre-training. So uh, just a brief reminder, uh, we looked into MBERT and XLMR and uh, that the problem with these model that these models have is that uh, they cannot actually represent all the 7,000 languages in a single model um, yeah, due to catastrophic interference between the languages. And in MADX, we assumed that they are still the best starting grounds to extend the model to more languages. But the question is whether or not that is actually true. So uh, in our paper that we presented at NACL, uh, we asked the question whether or not modularization during pre-training and pre during pre-training actually mitigates this catastrophic interference between languages and whether modularization at the start uh, makes it easier for us to add new languages down the line. So for example, low resource languages. Uh, again, just a brief reminder, in MADX, we start with a fully shared model, uh, meaning that all parameters are shared between all languages. And then we extend this model to become modular in the second step, freezing the pre-trained weights. Um, but the problem is that potentially these uh, uh, this pre-trained model has already been cursed by multilinguality, which uh, adding adapters doesn't really solve in the end. So instead, we uh, propose to add modules for each of these languages already at the start uh, and basically prepare the model to be modular and to be extended to more languages further down the line. 
Uh, our baseline is a shared, uh, fully shared model, similar to Embered and XLMR. Uh, and the modular version actually has language components um, for each individual language that we pre-train on. Um, the architecture is very similar to the adapters. We have a bit of a different residual connection due to learning instabilities. Um, but in order to be completely fair in comparison, we also um, uh, want to be able to have uh, the same number of flow point operations for each of the individual, uh, for the two models. So that's why we, the shared model uh, also integrates one module that is shared by all uh, languages, um, then guaranteeing us to have the same number of flow point operations. This also results in us having the same number of trainable parameters when we fine tune the model and on our target task, but also during pre-training. Each language has the same number of uh, trainable parameters, both the shared version and also the modular model. Task is the same number of trainable parameters. Float point operations is the same trainable parameters. Um, languages, tasks all have the same number of trainable parameters. This is how we designed it. Um, and the module can be used, but it doesn't have to be used because of the residual connections that surrounds the modular component. So uh, in order for us to measure the curse of multilinguality, we have a bit of a problem in, in the pre-training setup because if we fix the number of update steps, for example, we say all models, uh, depending like we train on more and more languages, we fix the number of training steps to 125,000. Um, and our first model is only trained on English. Uh, our second model is trained on English and French. Then we can see that the seen examples of English is uh, reduced uh, significantly compared to the first model. Uh, and this um, is exacerbated uh, even more the more languages we pre-train on. So now the last model, we have uh, a model trained on five different languages and um, the number of examples in English is just a fraction of the first model. So it's unclear if this is a fair comparison, um, even though all models have trained, been trained for 125,000 update steps. Alternatively, if we say, okay, we fix the number of examples per language, again, starting with 125,000 for English, and then we add French in the second model as well, and so on. Then we have to train for longer and longer. And this, um, yeah, might also be a problem. Uh, and it's unclear if we can compare these uh, models with each other again. So because we can't really solve it, we just uh, do both basically. Um, have two versions, once we fix the number of update steps and once we fix the number of seen of examples per language. We can first of all look at the perplexity. Uh, this is for the versions where we fix the number of examples. So all models have the seen the same number of examples for each of the individual languages. Um, and that's why the comparison between these models is actually fair. Um, yeah, uh, the, these are perplexity plots for all of the different languages um, where uh, per, uh, um, Orange is uh, the shared model and blue is the modular model. Just a brief reminder, higher perplexity means worse performance. So we want to have a low perplexity in order uh, for the model to potentially be better at language modeling. And we can immediately see that, um, yeah, the more languages we pre-train on uh, indicated by the X axis, uh, each dot or X being an individual model, uh, we can see that mo the more languages we pre-train on, the more the shared model is hit by the curse of multilinguality. So the worse the performance actually gets. Whereas the modular model actually uh, maintains performance, um, sometimes even improving um, the more languages we pre-train on. Uh, so this does indicate that uh, at least from a perplexity perspective, um, yeah, we, we are able to mitigate this catastrophic interference. Now, obviously we're not interested in perplexity, but actually downstream task performance. So we're evaluating again on zero shot cross-lingual transfer. It's a bit of a different scenario uh, here compared to Maddox, where instead of um, 
adding and stacking adapters, we actually freeze the uh, only the modular components uh, and fine tune all the pre-trained weights on our target um, on our target task, so that during inference we can re again replace the language components. So looking at the task performance, first of all, for the fixed number of update steps, here we present X and LI on the left and named entity recognition on the right. Um, each dot again indicates a different uh, model. Uh, each model here has been trained on 125,000 update steps. But uh, just a reminder, um, each model has therefore seen less examples per language. So all models were trained for 125,000 update sets, but the more languages we train on, the less examples the model has seen per language. Uh, and uh, we can see that the shared model uh, considerably loses in performance the more languages we pre-train on, whereas the modular model maintains performance. Um, so a similar pattern to the perplexity results that we had. And this is quite interesting because uh, that the model is actually able to maintain performance for each of the individual languages because it has actually seen less examples per language. So this was quite interesting uh, for named entity recognition, the performance even improves slightly, which is also quite interesting. Now, when we look at results for where we fix the number of examples per language, um, the performance is, uh, uh, the pattern is somewhat similar for the shared model, so the performance drops. Uh, however, for the modular model, the performance even improves. So uh, by modularizing mo the model from the start, um, we witness not only the mitigation of catastrophic interference, but actually positive influence. So even though the model does not see more examples in the target language, the positive influence of other languages actually results in a slight improvement. So the second question that we had is whether or not it's important to pre-train on a language. So uh, the question is, do what happens if uh, we have one model where we pre-trained on Arabic, so all the parameters are also fine-tuned on Arabic, versus the second version where we actually freeze the uh, pre-trained weights and only fine-tune newly introduced Arabic parameters. So what is the performance difference between these two versions of an Arabic um, modular model? So here we have two steps. We have two different models. Model one that is missing green, model two that is missing the purple uh, um, language. And then we compare the performance between these two models. So basically, yeah, what um, if there's a drop in performance for these uh, two, two different languages? We have a very complicated setup, splitting scripts, splitting language families. Sometimes language families have been pre-trained on, sometimes they haven't. Uh, for example, Kradai is a language family that one of the models has not seen before at, at, at all. Uh, we have a very complicated script, strip, uh, script like that that I won't go into detail because it turns out that there's no difference, at least in our evaluation. Uh, the performance of the pre-trained languages versus those that are added um, are more or less the same. And this indicates that independent, uh, it's not necessary to pre-train on all the languages. It's fine to uh, pre-train on a smaller set of languages that are diverse but high resource. And we can add languages later on with um, no measurable performance drop, at least for X and Y. So we argue that the curse has been lifted. By adding a small amount of language-specific capacity to the model, we're able to mitigate catastrophic interference between languages, improve per language performance, and uh, it allows us uh, to add more and more languages um, further down the line uh, with no measurable performance decrease, at least for X and a line. So I'll just take one more minute for future directions. Um, as Models get deeper and deeper, wider and wider with sparse uh, mixture of expert, expert models. Um, we're trying to train them on many different modalities, uh, which all interfere with each other. Um, by integrating modularity, we might be able to mitigate 
this uh, interference um, while being uh, making it more extendable to uh, and modular uh, that these modules can be composed and therefore improve the performance overall. Uh, very exciting direction in my opinion. Um, however, the question is, what is the best modular architecture? Is it uh, adapters? Is it sparse uh, subnetworks? Do we want to do routing deterministically, such as what I've been talking about in adapters? Or do we want to uh, learn routing, such as a mixture of expert scenarios? Um, how do we even evaluate modularity? Uh, how should we compose modular components? Should it be on the representation level, like activation, similar to what um, our adapter fusion scenario has been doing? Or should it be weight-based, such as the arithmetic operations of LTSFT? Um, in general, modularity is awesome because um, why, why I found modularity so awesome is because yeah, adapters are parameter efficient, modular, composable, and they have so many uh, applications in out of distribution scenarios. Uh, they generalize uh, very well in cross lingual transfer, but also in other uh, cross modal, cross domain uh, scenarios. Um, and finally, by integrating modularity already during pre training, we are able to mitigate um, this catastrophic interference, for example, between languages. So, thank you very much. Um, and now I'm happy to take more uh, uh, yeah, questions. Okay, so there's one question. Um, I wonder whether you're familiar with this pre-treatment uh, from UW. Uh, attempt. So it's called attentional mixtures of soft prompt tuning for parameter efficient multitask knowledge sharing. Uh, yeah, I think I uh, read it a while ago. Um, I can't really say anything uh, meaningful right now to it, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, it, it even uh, cites adapter fusion. So I think, yeah, it, it's very related to, uh, to some of my work. Thank you so much for this robust and thorough presentation. And thank you to all our attendees for your lively participation as well. We're so fortunate to have you here uh, presenting with Cohere for AI. And just again, thank you so much. Uh, no, thank you so much for having me. It was a blast uh, to be talking in this, uh, yeah, in this series. Thanks for having me.